All right. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, so uh, today we're going to do a little bit of a presentation about the collaboration between MegaDAO and Centrifuge. Uh, my name is Gustav. I'm from MegaDAO. And with me is, is Lucas. So, Lucas, if you want to take it away. Yeah, I'll uh, start with the first, um, the first part of this talk. And uh, what we want to talk about is this. Um, so you mentioned the collaboration with Maker, which is all about bringing um, real-world assets into DeFi. Um, and I'll talk about the part that we um, as Centrifuge have been playing. But uh, before that, just a very quick introduction. I'm one of the co-founders at Centrifuge. Uh, my background, and this is going to be relevant for the talk, is that I um, was working at this company called Talia. It's a large fintech in uh, San Francisco doing uh, supply chain finance. Um, I was uh, working in different startups and for the last few years um, been sort of trying to figure out how we can get um, supply chain finance, which I like to call one of the least sexy spaces in tech, into, uh, into the world of uh, crypto. Um, just to explain a little bit about supply chain finances, it's basically when businesses interact with each other, meaning they buy goods, they sell goods, they transfer value. Um, Usually there are, there are many different ways that um, banks and, and financial services companies um, offer, offer liquidity to, to, to uh, facilitate these transactions. Um, at Talia, we financed uh, about $20 billion of um, invoices. So imagine uh, you send an invoice to a large multinational. Your payment terms are usually around 60 days on average. Um, this means you deliver the goods, you send the invoice, you wait 60 days, and then you get your cash. And in the meantime, you want to invest that money, you need to pay your employees, you probably have already paid the goods that you sold, or like the materials that you needed a long time ago, right? So this is um, the early, early payments that we did at Talia. Supply chain finance overall is like a $200 billion market. Um, this is just all, sort of this entire market by itself. And then factoring, which is the the most traditional aspect of um, like B2B finance uh, products is um, like a $3 trillion market. And this is just banks that come in and buy invoices and give you a credit based on these. Like if you, however, if you look at just the amount of value transferred between um, companies, that's about $180 trillion per year. Um, so we're talking about very large numbers um, compared to what uh, crypto looks like today. Um, if you're going back to um, like these, the access to finance. Um, if you're a global 2000 company um, and you need to finance a deal, I don't know, you're Boeing and you need to build a bunch of planes, you're probably going to be talking to a bank and negotiating about basis points on top of LIBOR, the um, sort of the going interest rate for, uh, for uh, banks. Um, so this is incredibly low. Like at the moment, you talk about like 2.7%, for example. Um, Lisa's Pizza Joint or any small business that doesn't have uh, the, the size and the negotiating power that these uh, large companies have, they usually look at APRs of like 15% and upwards. So it can be quite easily can turn into like a 22% 20, 20, APR for financing that invoice that you're um, waiting to get paid from a large company. But um, just because you're a small, a small business, um, you end up paying a huge amount um, for that. So this is sort of what we want to address um, with, with Centrifuge. Um, which is change the rules of global trade uh, to foster economic opportunity everywhere. Which is, this is our mission. Um, we believe that by um, reducing this information asymmetry and making these, these uh, assets more easily tradable, um, we can address this huge discrepancy between the different, offers, uh, the different offerings that uh, companies have um, in, in this space. Um, I'll I'll bore you with a little bit of technical details to sort of explain what we've been doing. But um, Centrifuge itself is an open, completely open source, uh, open network um, built um, mostly around our peer to peer network, which um, sort of serves this purpose of having companies, different parties, um, settle, settle in invoice, uh, settle transactions off chain. Um, this is used to transmit information privately and at large scale. So. Um, you, you can send an invoice from Tire LLC to Big Car Inc. Um, and um, do that in private, completely trusted without a third party that would have any um, oversight. We then use um, 
Ethereum sort of to take uh, three to take three to do three important parts. Um, Ethereum is used to keep track of these identities that uh, the different companies, different players in this network use to interact with each other. Um, so on this peer-to-peer -peer network, all the messages are signed, uh, cryptographically signed, so the identities live on chain. Um, the other thing we have is anchors, which are used to sort of commit to the transactions uh, on chain. So imagine, um, Imagine I send a transaction to my counterparty, they cryptographically sign it, I now need to, I now take a hash of it um, and commit to it on chain. This gives me a proof of a timestamp and sort of a proof that this, this information hasn't been altered and this sort of has been agreed upon by, by both parties. Um, and the third, the, third, um, the third aspect is NFTs, right? So once you have an invoice, um, or a, a, like really any sort of document. We, we've also been doing this with uh, real estate, so mortgages. Um, once you have, you have this document off chain, you actually want to um, sort of trade it, right? Um, and for that, you use an NFT. So um, what you can now do with these off chain documents is you can mint non fungible tokens that are used to track, um, track the ownership of, of these, of, for example, an invoice. So that you can then go to a bank and sell them sell them this claim on the future revenue to get your cash right now. Um, so just how this works is um, you you verify your identity on chain, you commit to it, and then once you've committed to this, um, you can then mint your your NFT, um, which is sort of the first part of the of of the centrifuge protocol. It's a way to tokenize assets. Um, but we now have an NFT, right? And uh, what do you do next? Um, I mentioned you really what our, what we, what we, our users want to do. Is they want to get access to capital. They want to use these NFTs as collateral in DeFi. Um, they want to transfer them. Uh, they want to get their invoice paid early, right? Um, but the NFT actually um, is only, only tracks ownership, and now you still need to find a way that you um, actually get the money. Um, and this is where Centrifuge um, Tinlake, which is our, our uh, set of smart contracts, come in. Um, Tinlake solves this problem that um, you you have NFTs, but like sort of the way we've been been looking at the DeFi space over the last few years and seeing it evolve, um, there's a lot of hope around getting non-fungible assets into into these products. But the reality is that like DeFi as we know it today doesn't scale to the individual asset, right? I have one, more, one mortgage from one homeowner is radically different than a mortgage from another homeowner. Um, a, an invoice between company A and B is, is, is very different credit risk than an invoice between company C and D. So, um, and, and if you look at um, these, like, like, def like for example, Compound or MakerDAO, their, their, their governance structure, their risk models, it's about larger pools, larger groups of collateral that are fun usually fungible. Um, so what we need to build is we need to build a way to give, um, to, give um, to, to scale this um, sort of underwriting and to scale how these different assets are put into bigger baskets that then the DeFi ecosystem can actually um, interact with at a, at a bigger scale. Um, so, in essence, uh, Tinlake is a set of smart contracts where borrowers can lock up their NFTs. Um, this would be the an unpaid invoice NFT or a mortgage, a tokenized mortgage. Um, and then there, there are criteria that sort of control which assets can be added. Um, this is a very modular system. Um, but then in the end, what happens is that we mint this token, which is called a collateral value token. Um, that represents um, like one dollar or one unit of currency um, per per uh, per value that is locked up in uh, in the in this Tinlake contracts. So you end up with a with a share of um, this by owning this token. You end up owning a share of all of the collateral that is um, that is in this in this uh, bundle of assets. So just a brief overview of how that works. Um, you have, we have NFTs that get deposited. There's a way to price them, and, and according to that price, uh, we, the, the CVT contract, um, the ERC-20 token, gets minted um, in, in the correct amount. So we now have a CVT supply that represents roughly the value of the collateral, and that CVT supply can now be used um, in different lending facilities 
to ask collateral. And so you can lock that CVT into, um, for example, Maker, um, and then get, get a stable coin, and you give that stable coin um, to the actual borrowers that locked up the NFT, the homeowner or the, the small business that wants to finance an invoice. So in short, um, Thin Lake solves this problem that you have these off-chain assets that are quite unique that you need to value one by one. Um, so, so how that works is you, you give the, the, each individual borrower a different interest rate, but then there's only one like, interest rate that the CVT gets. So there's like, room to assign different uh, risks to different assets, but overall like, you end up with a portfolio that has a fairly stable um, risk. Um, it solves this problem that a lot of the DeFi products really can't talk ERC721. Um, and, and so it's like this framework to underwrite these assets, to get different funders um, into it. Um, you, you draw the currency from it and you give that to borrowers. <clears throat> so this brings me to the, to the end of my part about what I what, I, what we've been uh, working on together with Maker, which is uh, the technology that we use um, to create this um, ERC20 token that then can be used as collateral in uh, Maker. And uh, Gustav will now talk a little bit about the, the pro uh, proof of concepts we've been working on together. Yeah, so, oh, wow. So, so um, thank you very much, uh, Lucas. So, so basically, uh, I'm, I'm going to go through, so I'm not sure if all of you are familiar with Maker, but I'll, I'll take a standpoint that you you know the basics. I'm going to go through it uh, very quickly, but but basically, you know, from from like the initial birth of what's the Maker protocol today, we have aimed and strived towards having uh, more assets in our contracts rather than just uh, crypto assets. So just to to get a little bit in on that, you know, we really want to, you know, unlock the power of the blockchain to create economic empowerment. Uh, and this also means, you know, outside the crypto space, outside the technology space, and, you know, actually taking value to everyday consumers and users and, and you know, the traditional retail clients, including uh, also, you know, SMEs and, and other projects like that. And, and you know, uh, currently our system looks a little bit uh, like this when you take out a line of credit. So you, you come to our system, you, you post collateral, and then uh, our smart contract will verify the value of the collateral directly on the blockchain, uh, and then it will allow you to take out a line of credit, or essentially you actually print DAI in that moment. Um, but it's very similar to you know, how you would take out a line of credit in, for example, what we do with invoices in, in a traditional sense, like in, in trade finance. Um, currently, we have only been, been backed by crypto assets, so people would come and put Ethereum into our smart contracts. Uh, they would then print DAI or take a line of credit. And this has, of course, been, uh, not of course, but this has been quite successful for us. And we are currently the, the market leaders within the decentralized finance space, uh, within the crypto space, right? Um, and and that, that, that's, you know, like the initial step, but, but uh, later this year, and, and currently what we have been, been testing together with Centrifuge is our next, the full version of our protocol, which is, which is launching soon, which is called Multicollateral DAI. In Multicollateral DAI, we will not only accept Ethereum as collateral, but we will start accepting uh, different uh, standards of traditional world uh, assets, such as, you know, what we have been doing with the Tin Lake system, uh, as well as scaling this beyond just, you know, invoicing and mortgages and real estate, but actually going out to becoming, you know, a fully decentralized bank that could give loans or lines of credit against, you know, most of the digital assets we, we can imagine today, including bonds, stocks, and, and so on. But back to what we're doing currently, of course, initially we, we want to take assets like relatively simple to comprehend, relatively simple to, to sell off again, and relatively simple for, for the systems to understand. So therefore, therefore uh, debt instruments, such as invoices or mortgages, fits quite nicely into it. So um, some of the, the new things that we have been working on uh, currently and within uh, these uh, three specific uh, use cases, we already have uh, proof of concepts uh, running. We have done real-world transactions against these assets here. So some of them is, you know, factoring, uh, real estate finance. We also having one, I think uh, you guys will do a presentation la later today with them, right? Yeah, uh, where we actually have been giving uh, financing against upcoming royalty payments uh, for Spotify artists. 
So you know, we, we take some of these fields here where you can quite neatly, uh, with the data available, go out and provide credit against these uh, protocols here. And then that's what we use the, the MakerDAO CDP engine uh, to do. Um, so, um, this is, this is how it looks like for, for our system, right? Uh, Lucas, you went into a little bit, uh, especially some of the steps in the middle, where you kind of like have the ERC-20s getting issued uh, against the NFTs. Uh, so I think the very important thing here, which was also a point we, we had raised earlier, both in the panel and the, the first presentation here, is that you know for the user, they, they don't need to feel the blockchain or feel decentralization or anything like that, right? They need to have efficiency, access to liquidity. It needs to be easy, it needs to be understandable, right? So for the user, they will just have, you know, a very, very simple front end that they can go in and interact with. And then the whole machinery on the back end will be able to recognize the collateral that they post uh, through the, the setup that we have, the framework that we have. And for us, it's really about, you know, creating a standardized process for this, um, especially in regards to all these different collateral types that comes in. So for us, you know, Tin Lake was like the, the perfect partner to, to pursue these things with because they do exactly that, right? Um, then for in our system, the way that it works is we are completely over collateralized. So if you post collateral and the price of that collateral drops uh, below the loan to value threshold that we have preset, uh, we will also initiate an auction. Uh, so in the, in the system here, uh, I'll go to a, bit, a little bit more into the legal framework for it, but it basically means that we need to be able to sell off these, these assets as well, right? And I'll get back to how we do that. Um, so, yes, that's here. So, um, basically, you would have like the originator of the, the debt of the asset. They will take that asset and they will then pledge it into a special purpose vehicle, which is a, a separate entity, a, a company set up only to deal with the assets coming in from these companies. Uh, the special purpose vehicle, the SPV, will then issue uh, a notary a note that gives very, very clear uh, instructions, uh, very asset-specific language uh, about what will happen in terms of a liquidation. So, you know, normally if you have a liquidation in, or like a margin call in, in a system like this, you would take the asset itself and you would then, you know, want to sell it off to, to other people. But the issue here is that uh, for an auction like this to be efficient, especially with the different assets coming in, people need to be able to recognize the value of the asset. So instead, here, uh, instead of you know selling off the actual invoice or the actual mortgage, which you know, in, especially with vo lower volume asset types, can be quite difficult, uh, this node gives uh, sets up uh, a, a, like a, a debt uh, obligation for the issue of the asset, so they actually need to repay the purchaser of this asset in DAI in a short-term debt instrument. So that means instead of purchasing a short-term mortgage or an unpaid invoice, you actually per purchase a debt obligation that you have to get paid in DAI after the initial period of that asset runs out. Uh, so thereby we can actually standardize, uh, standardize a lot of these assets coming in allowing people to do their own assessment against the asset, but without the need to actually take over like an individual mortgage or something like that. But instead, they will take over the obligation of getting paid in DAI. And then, of course, people will go in and be able to assess themselves what is the chances of me actually receiving the DAI, what is the chance of me receiving the full amount of the DAI. And, and that's something you can go in and assess on like an individual basis, but it's much easier than actually having to receive, you know, let's say like a mortgage from the US. It would be pretty difficult for me as someone in Denmark to, you know, accept the mortgage from the US. So this is a little bit about like what what happens off chain um, in like the the legal legal framework, and we are not saying that this is the only way to do it or this is the best way to do it, but this is the most optimal way where we can standardize specifically these asset types coming in uh, in in a way that it actually becomes quite liquid even in terms of uh, a liquidation. Um, yeah, and then I would also say that we, we have actually already done uh, the first mainnet transactions. Uh, so this is uh, the first time that uh, real-world assets have been used as collateral in decentralized finance. Uh, so we've been working tirelessly on this, uh, especially this, the Centrifuge team, uh, in like the last few months. And I think when was the first one? Like three, four weeks ago or something? 
Yeah, I think yeah, so. Some, it, was, uh, it was a actually two mortgages, a house and uh, a refinance of a house and a fix and flip mortgage. Yeah, so uh, so th this has um, been very very exciting, uh, and this is something that you know, uh, as uh, make uh, make us uh, multi collateral die launches uh, in the upcoming period. Uh, like when that launches, this is something we are looking to scale, right? So this is like the first initial transactions, but the goal and the aim of this is to create a framework that can be scaled up to you know a lot more companies than just the 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 ones in our current pilot projects right now. So now I'm just going to go in and tell you a little bit about like we, we're going to go through like two of the of the pilots that we have done. Um, one of them is is a new silver, that's a, a short term mortgage uh, to basically uh, help uh, real estate developers finance uh, like flipping houses. So you know they would buy a house, they would take a short term mortgage with the intent of them selling the house in. 6, 12, 18 months, something like that, uh, to people at a profit, right? So it's, it's a place that generally is quite difficult to price and it's something where it's been quite difficult also for banks. So right now you have these like big consortiums sitting around and dealing with thousands of these, uh, these mortgages. Um, we have done the first transactions with them um, and this is uh, the on-chain transactions for what actually happened. Uh, so. If you see up here, then you can see how they actually they post uh, the collateral value token that, that Lucas talked about before into uh, the, the contracts of Maker, and then they get paid out $70,000 of DAI. Uh, so this is, this is a main net transaction uh, where they actually they received DAI and they pledged the collateral. Uh, so, so, yeah, I think, yeah. That's uh, probably what I can say about that. Um, all right, yeah, so and then the next one, Lucas. Maybe um, before I just jump into a little bit more detail. Um, so what we did in these, so we did, uh, I think by now or by today, it's going to be five proof of concepts that we're highlighting too. Um, but sort of the, the strategy we had here is, well, like MCD is not live yet, but um, we want to get some experience actually doing these. So we, we deployed the Tinlay contracts to mainnet. And instead of having um, MCD fund this with by opening a, a collateralized debt position and um, and drawing DAI, actually generating DAI, the, actually, the Maker Foundation actually provided a loan um, that then was used, as a loan in DAI um, that was then put into into the Tinlay contract, sort of mimicking the, the CDP. And you see um, two, two or four transactions of ERC-20 tokens. Um, you have a 120 thousand tokens this is the value of the house um, so this is the value of, of the of the um, of the asset the nft here uh, first being minted and given to the tinlay contract and then those are actually um, deposited into the address that sort of acts as the cdp uh, in this instance so this uh, the the cdp address now received 120000 cvt tokens um, and and then Actually, from that same address, we took 70,000 DAI. So in like post MCD go live, if, if, if this transaction were to be made with Maker, what would actually happen is we would lock the CVT token into the CDP and uh, draw the DAI from it. So the DAI would get minted by, by the, the Maker smart contract system. Um, and then first they're, they're given to Tinlake and then ultimately given to the borrower. This is the borrower. Um, who in turn has to um, lock in the NFT into uh, the Tinlay contracts. Um, then later on, this the borrower would repay the DAI plus interest and um, move um, and receive the, the NFT back. Um, so get the collateral back, and the CVT token uh, would be removed from the CVT uh, from the CDP. Uh, com uh, confusing. Um, to uh, and, and be burned now that the collateral is not in locked up in Tinlink anymore. Um, it looks complicated um, a little bit, but uh, we'll show you like a, a better view on that later. Um, the other um, uh, proof of concept we wanted to highlight is um, Dex Freight. Dex Freight uh, is a well, in in like one sentence, it's a freight um, broker or a, a, a platform for for uh, matching uh, shippers with customers. Um, and they have, and they obviously like invoicing is, is part of it. So like you, you ask for a quote, you deliver it, you, invo you invoice for the freight, and then the, the shippers get paid um, 
30, 60, 90 days later, um, and 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 these shippers actually want to um, finance these transactions because, well, like by the time you're getting your money paid, like you've already burnt the fuel you needed to uh, to ship the ship the goods across the country. Um, the freight invoices in the U.S. are like a, a truckload is like usually around two thousand dollars or less. So there's many small transactions, like something that would be hard. Um, to actually scale at volume, right? If, if every single asset um, would have to be put into uh, Maker, that would be that would take would put quite a bit of load onto Maker governance to um, to approve these. So, so what De Dexray did in this instance is they deployed an deployed an instance of Tin Lake um, that takes these different freight invoices, um, bundles them up, and issues one CVT token that now represents a group of collateral that hopefully has a much lower risk because it's uh, distributed across different shippers um, and of, of course scales much better as well as now we have like one one uh, token that ne needs to get approved in, in the CDP and as this portfolio grows, this, this portfolio of invoices grows and shrinks, sort of the, only the, the difference is being removed or added from the, the debt to maker. Um, <clears throat> So what we did with Dexfreight is they they financed a few NFTs and are on, on an ongoing basis still um, financing more as every day as uh, as new invoices are are uh, are being made out that uh, that they want to finance. Um, I'll show you like the, the one part that um, uh, the the UI for for how this looks. Um, the Dexfreight mints these NFTs using their um, Using their platform that they have for um, where the invoices actually exist, so the this this is the the platform that the shippers and the customers use to agree on the terms and then receive the invoice and 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 uh, transact. Um, and then once once this NFT exists, it, um, they actually go to like right now our our uh, Tin Lake DAP, which allows them to deposit these NFTs and uh, draw the die from it. And as you can see. Um, so that we have like this, these two important numbers. This is the the outstanding debt. So this is the money that um, these three loans that were added um, that you can see here um, in this example were um, financed, um, and the collateral value is the the total value of the uh, of the invoice. Um, and so this, so basically, this is the the CVT token that is minted. Um, this is the die that was drawn from the CVT uh, from the CDP, um, and you, you see sort of the the the, the maker community and and um, and everyone can look at okay, like what exactly is this portfolio made out of? What are the the different interest rates here, and what are the different debts um, of of these individual assets? So this is also one of the, the transactions we did on mainnet. So. Um, it's, we'll, uh, we'll publish the, the DAP that you will be able to look at uh, this in the coming days. Um, this concludes the talk, so we wanted to open it up for uh, questions. If you could repeat afterwards. Yeah. Oh, that's loud. Hey. Oh. <laughs> um, how do you guys deal with pricing? So the, um, the two transactions that you showed, uh, I assume, were pretty easy. It's a house and, and freight. But how, at scale, how do you see dealing with pricing of, of, these, of these assets? Um, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, in these specific scenarios, uh, this is depth, right? So it's something that is already priced. I mean, you know, if you have an invoice of $1,000, it's worth a thousand dollars. If you have a mortgage of one hundred and twenty thousand dollars, I mean that that's worth one hundred and twenty thousand dollars, right? So the, these uh, like these instruments that we're doing currently, they're like relatively easy to price. Uh, like the risk of it is is a little bit uh, of a different scenario, right? But but the pricing of it is relatively easy. If you go out and you go out to like some of the more obscure assets, I mean. That's exactly what, what Lucas also said, that you know, it's, it's very difficult to go in, for example, let's take you know, just like individual houses right, without a mortgage in it, like if you wanted to lend against that, or if you have you know, other assets that isn't you know, like generally priced, so if you go outside of the bond, commodities, a, a stock space, then it gets much more difficult. Uh, but that's also something that's you know, a little bit further down the road, at least uh, from, from the, ma the maker side of things, right? Uh, so f for now, that's why we are with assets like this, because we, we can actually price them, because they, they already price before they come into our system. Can I, can I can, yeah, just one, one thing about the, the mortgage transactions. This is not, we didn't do this yet, but... Um, <coughs> sorry. sorry. Um, one, one thing that we are doing um, is that 
we're talking to uh, like appraisal companies to act as oracles to to these um, to these mortgages, so they can verify that the underlying collateral that that is the actual house that in this mortgage is has the value that the mortgage says it was appraised at. Um, so there 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 are things like that. Um, in the end, we have to build um, build like sort of some sort of governance underwriting um, element into it that also can can, can price the risk in, into this way. Well, that was my follow-up question. Uh, mortgages might be easy, but if you take something like an invoice, you've got to price the risk of payment or repayment, uh, default of the invoice in there. Um, and so, yeah, there might be a face value of the invoice or, or the mortgage, but there's always, you, you've got to price in the risk. So, so, yeah, so like one with, with invoices, one... Um, one thing you can do, for example, is you have you have factoring companies that are ser servicing these loans, right? They're actually giving the the borrowers the the, f the the fiat if they want fiat. They um they they take care of actually collecting on these invoices if they're not paid. And so, like one one idea would be um, to involve them in, in also helping us price the price the the bundled assets. But yeah, it's uh it's something I mean we can sort of achieve a scale. Yep. Yeah, I would, I would also say so. We we for example, Maker, we have an official partnership with TradeShift. So TradeShift is the biggest supply chain uh, platform in, in the world, right? Uh, they have 1.5 million companies on the platform uh, where they show like all the transactional data. And in general, where invoices, for example, usually are is like uh, where you can get uh, invoice financing is, for example, on like accounting platforms. You know, we have a bunch of them all over the world. And if you tap into something like TradeShift or tap into an accounting platform, then you already have a lot of transactions. You have actually the entire like transactional history of each company, right? I would also say that, that in a lot of uh, trade finance cases, you would usually have the small suppliers wanting trade finance against invoices that they need to have paid for supplies that they have sent to large companies, right? So if you have, for example, the, the, the companies that supply materials to BMW in Germany, I mean, BMW in Germany will often be, they will be the ones underwriting the invoices, right? Because they're the ones who have to repay them. So default rate is, is often actually a little bit uh, on the low side, right? I mean, it's highly unlikely. We also work, or we also have uh, companies that, that we want to work with in the future that, for example, gets uh, paid by the government. So then it's also relatively uh, easier, I would say, to go in and calculate things as like default risk. Um, but of course, if you go between like two SMEs, it can be much more difficult. Hey, I just wondered if you saw any application for venture debt financing. So, for example, VCs investing in startups, rather than you know buying shares, they could buy a debt obligation, which can be repaid in shares based on the uh, future increase of the, of the company's value. Uh, yeah, what's the question? I, I just want, like, wondered if you like if you considered that. Like, is it way off in the future? Is it something on your roadmap? Yeah, so, I mean, we, we have definitely looked into frameworks on how to deal with debt obligations as collateral, right? Uh, we have been looking into it, like, mostly on the retail side, uh, because that was where we got, like, the imminent question, you know, which was, you know, like, you need to have collateral to take a loan at Maker, right? So how do you deal with that? And, and there, are, there are definitely frameworks where you can move, like, around uh, having, you know, an actual asset as collateral, but using, you know, future uh, payments as collateral. Uh, but but it's, not, it's not something that's, like, on the immediate, like, short-term roadmap. It's something you'll probably see a little bit further out in the future. Um, how are you thinking about the loan-to-value ratio with, all, with regards to all these different types of, um, you know, uh, collateral? And uh, is the maker governance model going to be, I mean, will, are we going to be able to affect the loan-to-value ratio thinking and structuring uh, as maker holders? <clears throat> sure. So, I mean, the way, the way that the, the loan-to-value uh, ratio per asset will be put in, that will be, you know, done by selecting a, a, a risk team. There will be risk teams that will help assess what the recommendation of a loan-to-value uh, ratio will be, right? Uh, but then again, it's also flexible, right? Because in some cases, you, would, you could actually... Like what we have also been been doing with with some of the the MCD collaterals we have, for example, uh, with Ethereum, you could have different LTV ratios, but then each ratio will, would you know pay different interest rates. Mm -hmm. So, for example, if you want to have a 125% loan-to-value ratio, which would be you know more 
uh, desirable for people who want to use it for higher leverage purposes, then they would have to pay a higher interest rate for having the lower loan-to-value. So it's it's quite flexible, uh, but of course, like like every single time you have to take these uh, decisions in regard to risk, the mega token holders will be part of the process. Cool. Uh, and I mean, the assets that we do with, with Tindlake now is also something that, you know, we'll need to get approved before we can actually you know, use it in MCD. So it's not like something we're like taking in through like a back door. Uh, we are we are definitely gonna go through the the public like public uh, governance process we have. Now it's it's similar already the the same question is about how we are going to manage this kind of risk of the new collateral in the MKR token. So if you take more risk, probably it will be more profitable. If you take or, or it will be more risky. But in some way, this governance will generate different uh, uh, different different uh, in the MKR token. They will be generate different assets because if you take so much risk or less risk, the asset the token will be different. No, in some way. Uh, so, like, are you asking specifically about these or about assets in general? Assets in general, if you yeah. take more risky assets, the probably the yes. token holders yes, will... Yes, of, of course. So, in, in multi-collateral DAI, we will have, uh, you know, there will be, like, two ma like two things you would need to pay for an asset. You would need to pay uh, the risk premium, which will go in and price the asset according to the risk of that asset. In that, we will take things into account, such as you know, what is the volatility of the asset, what is the liquidity of the asset, you know, where where's the asset base, you know, all, all these like different uh, factors you would take in when you price traditional financial instruments, right? And then we will also have the die savings rate. So the die savings rate is uh, a tool to drive adoption, right? But but that that will basically be like the price of the asset. Uh, these things are flexible. So for example, you could expect that Ethereum. Sorry, but would probably be higher priced than real estate, right? Um, I wonder why, but you know that that will be the case. Uh, and then, you know, like it's it's really gonna go on like a case case by case basis, right? Um, this is also why we we need to work with guys like these to standardize what what will be like the the input into the system, right? Because if we don't standardize some of the things coming in and like bundle them together, then we would need to evaluate, you know way, way too many assets. So this is like a, a way of, of creating a framework that can kind of like put assets that are like similar uh, mechanisms in it to put them into like a, a group of assets that then can be used as collateral. Hi, um, you showed the real estate example in terms of short time finance. Is there any plans to create a pound back stable coin or euros? Because obviously you couldn't do that um, in the UK, because if the dollar <laughs> and the pound keeps tumbling, then you know that won't work. Yeah, so um, we we've actually we've made uh, quite a lot of uh, progress on this topic as well, and it has all the time been been the plan of issuing Dai in in other currency forms as well. Uh, so we expect the first ones to come out. Uh, you know, I'm I'm a little bit optimistic probably, but you know, end of this year. But but it's probably going to be like early next year. You know, within the f the first quarter or two, we will see uh, other currency types coming out, and we already have the the design of how we want to do it in place, uh, and we're not going to limit it only to different currency types. We're also going to issue, you know, different asset types such as, you know, you could imagine having, you know, a token pegged to U.S. stocks, for example, that would, you know, allow people outside of the U.S. to invest easily into these equities. We have actually already released one pegged to the S&P 500 together with UMA, uh, and we are looking to use these frameworks. So, yes, uh, and it will be done according to demand. So, you know, you could imagine that Euro, Great British Pound, Singaporean Dollar, and so on will be the first ones. Hi. Um, if you're going to make tokens representing different fiat currencies, how are the conversations with the various different regulators and those currencies going? So if DAI represents dollars and you're going to do GBP and euros, are the various jurisdictions having an interest in, in those tokens as well? Uh, so, I mean, we, we have had ongoing conversations with, with regulators. Uh, we also have uh, legal opinions uh, of you know, DAI operating in a lot of different jurisdictions, including the Europe and the UK. 
we haven't quite gotten to the point where we have talked with them about how do we react to having you know, uh, a Great British Pound token specifically issued in the UK. Uh, but, but so far from like the conversation we've had with, with the, the legal team to work with all around the world, uh, there's a very high probability that, you know, we can mimic the same uh, regulatory framework we have around the dollar die. But of course, we, we could expect that, you know, some jurisdiction would be more against it, right? Uh, also because, you know, we haven't seen a centralized version of Great British Pound being, being issued yet because of uh, there's some issues around, you know, I think you need an e-money license to issue it, right? Uh, so, so in regards to like specifically euros and Great British Pound, uh, us being decentralized will, you know, according to what we have heard so far, give us a pretty big advantage in how, because the way we issue it is, is vastly different than, you know, holding an escrow account. Um, and, you know, you could even have, for example, I mean, if the UK uh, would, would go against it, right, you could have a, a Great British Pound still that just wouldn't be issued like for UK customers. And do you think you might default back to the original kind of MKR vision of doing something against the SDR? Uh, I mean, I expect definitely that to be uh, one of the currencies we will issue, right? Uh, you know, we've also seen that, you know, there's been talks about, you know, Libra. I mean, we could make a die that's pegged to Libra, but we will actually give the holders of that Libra die an interest rate. So, you know, if you hold the Facebook Libra, you know, the big companies and corporations will receive the money. If you hold the Dai Libra, well, it will have the same peg, but you will just receive an interest rate for holding it. Uh, so we're definitely looking into, uh, into solutions like that. One more question. One last question, please, if there is any. So am I right in imagining that I can use my own uh, mortgage uh, to, uh, and open a CDP with it in the future? Um, you, as a single individual, it probably would be a little bit of a hassle to set up the entire process. But the goal is, and, and like what New Silver, for example, is doing, they are they are using they're they're looking to use um, basically a CDP in, as an addition to their tradi more traditional uh, sources of capital to start underwriting mortgages. So they issue mortgages and then they uh, finance them with uh, with a CDP. So yeah, that is that is the goal. All right. So is so it the question? that's in the back of my mind is a uh, one of identification so how, how do you make sure i do not do this three times using different addresses or you know this i mean you know? this like in, in in the example of, of new silver right like this these these mortgages are legal contracts and there are <clears throat> there are strategies in place to um Make sure that this doesn't happen in uh, in the real world. We'll have to like those all still have to be followed, um, and then in the end you have to um, like you'll have to rely on, for example, these oracles right that I mentioned that are giving appraisals and information about um, what a what the status of the property title is um, as a, as additional data points that can um, sort of mitigate this risk. But I would expect this to be similar in. Um, like a similar risk than what it, what exists today in the uh, real world, right? Without without a die, it's the same the same problem. Yeah, it's, it's also so like for example, if you use the SPV structure, right? I mean, you would essentially sign over like the 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 rights of like doing operations with your house the same way you like for example, if you go to a bank and you take out a mortgage, the bank takes your house as collateral, right? And if you don't pay off your mortgage, the bank has the legal claim to go out and auction off your house if certain parameters are not met. Uh, you would have the same conditions in place in an SPV, and you can then have, you know, uh, like for example, like we've been calling it like a binary oracle, right? Where you would have a, a notary or like a law firm that would basically, you know, send a one or a zero to the CDP holding, you know, the house in it, right? And if it all of a sudden goes to zero, that means you, you're not you know, the owner of it anymore, and then, you know, the house is, is, is out of it, right? So there's definitely some things that you can do to take, like, these measurements against it, right? Uh, but, but, but then again, you know, it, it's something where uh, the legal frameworks we have created for this might not be suitable to deal with exactly that situation, uh, but it's something that, you know, constantly evolving. Uh, so, yeah. Thank you, guys.